Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Peelan. I'm the Vice Chair of Studies and Photography. Uh, welcome to the second in a series of events, the Chain, in which photographers and people connected with the photographic community interview a selected guest for each event. Today's interviewee will be the interviewer for the next event and so on. Uh, before we begin, can I make another quick plug for studies in photography? If you're not already a member, I'd encourage you to please have a look at the membership options on our website at studiesinphotography.com. As, as a member, you'll get access to a broad photographic community, receive a regular newsletter, get advance notice and sometimes free entry to our talks and exhibitions, and you'll receive two copies each year of our journal, The Acclaimed Studies in Photography. Also now you'll get unlimited access to a digital back catalogue spanning almost 40 years of studies in photography. So I'm now delighted to hand you over to our interviewer for this session, Robin Glanders. Robin. Thanks, John. Uh, well, it's a huge pleasure to be interviewing my old friend uh, with whom I've had a sort of parallel career, I suppose, in many ways. Uh, just to introduce Dave Williams. Um, after studying English and sociology in the early 70s, Dave became a professional musician and songwriter. He took up photography in 1980, and his work has been widely exhibited and published internationally. So Dave has worked in several major collections and he's the recipient of a range of major awards and prizes. In 2018, he was nominated for the Kyoto Prize in Arts and Philosophy. He became head of photography at Edinburgh College of Art in 1990, and was appointed reader in 2003. He retired from ECA in 2017. His practice is wide ranging and we're going to look at a small selection roughly in chronological order. It is a small selection. Uh, as I said, Dave's practice is extremely wide ranging, uh, embracing all, all genres really and all, all manner of photography. But let's start chronologically right back in 1980 and this remarkable image uh, in the botanical gardens. Dave, do you want to say something about this? Thank you, Robin, and thanks for that introduction and thanks for choosing me to be the next link in the chain. It's a, it's a great initiative. I'm, I'm very proud to be part of it. This image, yes, I was possibly even still a musician in those days. And this is from, I think, my first or second roll of film. I used to hang out in the botanics a lot. It's a bit fluky in some ways, but when it came through in the darkroom, I just connected with it in a way that kind of unspeakable in some ways, but it was what I wanted. It's what I'd loved in music. You know, it, it dealt with opposites. It tried to reconcile. I mean, what we have here is an old man who's apparently sitting in a pram. He's not, of course. He's, um, you could do that digitally these days, but he sat in a seat further down. We assume there's a child behind the hood of that pram. And conveniently for my purposes, there's a statue of, I think, the Virgin and the Christ in the pram as well, actually. So all kinds of things going on. So it's these two characters, one at the, towards the end of his life, the other one at the beginning, in the same vehicle, on, and the, on the same journey. Mm. Um, and one is the other, one has been the other, one will be the other. You constantly throughout the next few minutes we're going to discover that words kind of break down that for me that reflected a lot of the music I loved the writing Leonard Cohen Bob Dylan I was so much older then I'm younger than that now um, whoever uh, Leonard Cohen Bob Dylan Joni Mitchell um, for some reason they played with opposites not all the time but a lot of the time it was important to them mm. and for some reason it was important to me and that became more apparent as time went on yeah, yeah. So, in a way, you said this was one of your, your first couple of roles of film. Yeah. So the, the image was made intuitively, presumably, yes. and, and and very very quickly. And it's only after you saw it yes. coming up in the developer, and after yeah. you considered it after the event, that you realised the significance of what you were looking. Right. Even the way it was framed, actually, was a bit. You know, I was so naive in those days, but I just managed to get it. Yeah. You know. So it's, and, and it's brilliant. And, and and there's a sense in which you can look back on things that you've done naively yeah. and say, hey, this is a great picture. You know? Yeah, it becomes pivotal in retrospect. And I think yeah. the things we're looking at today will will come into that, that category. Yeah. And what it for saw was this, when I became more familiar with this opposites thing, it's a terrible expression, but yeah. 
was this notion of non-duality, um, which I'm not going to bang on about, but I think even at the moment, let's just get it out of the way. <laughs> now, here's a definition, user-friendly. Non-duality is simply a word that attempts to describe the reality that there is only oneness arising as everything and there is no separation. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not going to go too far down that route, but I discovered the more I worked, the more I worked, it became, and then, of course, I read around it and... Uh, but nevertheless, I hope the images are interesting to look at. They're not yeah. about non-duality, yeah. but they're kind of driven by that. And as you said, we, we're picking up one thread here in my work. I've done weddings and christenings like yourself. We've done everything, you know. Mm. And this is a thread that down the 40 years, and of course now it's almost permanent. Okay, okay. Well, look, let's, let's move on to a, a major project. Uh, I think probably one, one of your first um, extensive projects that lasted quite a long time uh, and this is work that certainly wasn't made naively was it I mean this was a long-term project at St Margaret's School for Girls yes. uh, this is from 1984 I can't believe it's that old I know um, no. and it, this came about through the Scottish Arts Council actually it wasn't my idea and the school and I was kind of reluctant to do it but I needed money to be honest mm. and of course it changed my life completely yes it is naive, though, a lot of it. Some of it I love, some of it I can't stand. But that's not... If we could just go back, Robin, to the first one, I'll just say a couple more words about it. Yeah. It's in the gym. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay, it's fine. Um, but even looking back, this opposites thing is in there. If you look through that book, there are compare and contrast age thing again, the pram again, really, page to page, opposite pages. I'm plowing that, and particularly here, the image that kind of sums it up, it's the pram again, really, you know. Mm. Um, and then if you go to the next one, yeah. the duality, terrible word, it's here in one image. To me, these girls look 50 years old already. Mm. You know, I, I, I look at it and they just look so, I don't know, it was, uh, the story behind this image is hilariously funny. But there, there's a tension there of opposites. Of that, I mean, they're what five years old. Mm. Mm. Just to add, I mean, one of these girls she contacted me last year, she's a consultant pediatrician in Philadelphia, she wanted to buy this print. Joe, the elder girl in the previous image, I saw her for coffee last week. She's got three children now, she's 55 years old, and it's just been an utter delight down the years that I bumped into some of them, some of them have kept mm. in touch. Mm. That's photography. Isn't yeah. it? You know all about that in Portraiture Robin. It's... And, and, and that, you know, that first image, it does sum it up really, doesn't yeah. it? I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it, 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 that image, the pivotal image, is what the project is about, you know, if, yeah. we, can, if we can talk in those terms, you know. Yeah, what's the project about? Well, it's about that. Yeah. It is, and it's, you know, it's, it's rough in parts. See, it's my very first project. Mm. Some of it I don't like, and other things I do. The next image, Looking back again, you know, this business of images being pivotal in retrospect, this absolutely propelled me forward. Mm. You know, it's, you know, it's as near abstract as you can get, actually. A little black shape at an angle in a, in a kind of a void with there's actually footsteps there. Mm. Mothers used to look at this and get quite moved and teary about it. And I can see why. Again, mm. there's the tension there, you know. A kid is playing, enjoying herself, four-year-old in this case. But already it's over. See, so walking out the frame, albeit at a jaunty kind of angle, mm. it's, kids leave home. You know? And there's a sense in which there's the inevitability of it. And yeah. so what I'm saying is, for me at least, it's not just an image of a child playing in the snow. Yeah. It, it gave me a sense of, if a little black object in a white canvas can do that, Maybe I should fool around with something a bit more abstract anyway, and that's what came. And that's what that's what you went on to do. It's well, missed all 19, kinds of other all kinds of other things, you know. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is 1989. 18, 18, 89, yeah, yeah. So and, yeah. and Dave, I remember when you made this work or you were making this work, I remember thinking, what on earth is going on here? Yes. So this is this is uh, 15 years after you started photography and you'd been working mainly photographing people or... or oh, no, no, it was know. much quicker than 15 years. Sorry? It was much, much quicker than 15 years. It started in 1980. Oh, right, right, yes, okay. 
Okay, so th th this was the culmination of it, wasn't it? This was when it was exhibited in in nineteen. 89. Yeah, so it's, um, only actually, it's only actually eight years after this phase, <laughs> after yeah. photography. You know? And people thought it was a bit strange. I mean, I, and I think, you know, for a while you struggled with it and um, others did too. And I did as well. And truth told, what happened here was that I actually became ill. It's not about illness, but I mentioned it in a particular context. But I, became, I got this thing called ME, which you'll remember, Robin, and I was really struggling. And I had a big grant to go to America, you know, in the back of the St. Margaret's thing. I was a bit of a golden boy, et cetera, et cetera. I, by the way, I should thank Murray Johnson for that St. Margaret's, uh, pulling me out from under a stone. You know, he was an extraordinary character, Robin. And I think you'll agree. Absolutely. Like, talent and uh, anyway, miss him a lot. So I couldn't go to America. I couldn't do the documentary photography thing. I was stuck in bed really for a long time. So as an artist, you, you work with what's around you. What was around me and my the little I could walk and move around were, you know, bits of light but indoors and screw heads and walls. And this is what this is. And the title, of course, doesn't get more down the middle in terms of opposites than this is. Mm. <laughs> you know, there's no, there's, you've got these extremes, but I'm, what I'm alluding to or trying to is this thing that's going straight down the middle and, uh, Maybe go to the next slide. You know? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say before we do, I mean, sure. very, very quickly, because, you know, we don't have much time today. Yeah. But in the same way that that portrait of the two girls in the St. Margaret's um, uh, project tells us what it's about, this page is ecstasies and then the Roman numerals and then for Glenn Gould at the bottom. Yes. It, it, it doesn't explain the work in any way, but it gives us an, an introduction to what the sort of area we may look to find meaning from the work. Yes. Um, so, you know, if we go, there's just a couple of these. If you, and, if yeah. you stick with that one just now, but, and it's arranged in a kind of musical central, but I have to say, you know, there, um, there are 22 of them, and it, they're like, it's like a suite that there's certain formal shapes dovetail into others actually I won't go into it in depth here but um and it was a solitary business this work was it evoked the most uh, negative um comments the photographer's gallery had ever experienced in their book mm -hmm. their comments book which was disappointing to me but um then it went on to be shown with um Andy Warhol and Joseph Boyce in Germany I don't well, see that through any kind of immodesty but you know who's right yeah. Not, actually, the London lot were probably just as right as the German lot. Well, <laughs> of course, you know, in the mid '80s th through to the mid '90s, sure. photographers were beginning, or you know, so-called fine art photographers, whatever that is, were beginning to work in enormous prints and colour and yeah. so on. And and these prints are tiny, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And you know, if we if we go forward to the photographer's gallery installation. Well, this is the German, this is the German installation. Oh, it's a, oh, it's a German installation, ah, yeah, so yeah. I beg your pardon. Sorry. Yeah. But of course it would have looked the same in the photographer's gallery as well, wouldn't it? I don't think the space was quite as, I mean, the Germans really went for this in a yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm not, you know, the photographer's gallery, people like Martin Parr were very big then, all that kind of social realism coming through. Folks just didn't like this. Uh, at the time, I think, it's actually worn quite well now, and uh, yeah. I think it sits. In terms of that, if you go back two images very quickly, yeah, the first one, you know, it's the ultimate in turning opposites, dualities on their head. You know, you've got a cruciform in darkness, you've got a snake-like shape in light, and mm -hmm. they're kind of connected. Yeah. Beyond that, I really can't see. All I can see, and listen, man, I've printed my weight in crap down the years many many times but for me it's still probably the best picture i've taken really it's all been yeah. trying to repeat this in a way that i can't explain yeah good okay well listen we should move on yeah do i do. think uh, if that's okay dave yes of course and we come to this work from 1995 <laughs> yes. uh, source and Here's music again, isn't it? Uh, you know, the, the, the reference that you were a musician. Uh, the previous project was for Glenn Gould, the great classical pianist, of course, mm -hmm. who reinterpreted Bach. Uh, and here's a work uh, which seems to be partly a visual representation of music or a chord being played. Can you say something about this? 
Yeah, I mean, music certainly, but also maybe, you know, Barnett Newman or Rothko. The difference being that these are, this is real, it's photographic, inverted commas, real. Um, it's five metre square panels. I really didn't have a clue if this gonna work, was going to work. You remember this show, Robin? You were in it. I, I, I remember helping yeah. you make the pictures. Oh, and and, and, and interestingly, I think this is the, is this not, you know, one of the very, very few studio uh, yes. in, in installations or studio construction yeah. that you I ever mean, did. I, I mean, maybe I could just go to the, the next one to show the two yeah. left-hand panels to get a better idea of yes. how the, the five look. Fine. And of course you helped me, I remember calling you up all the time. I used every light in the studio, flash, <laughs> everything. Every I had no clue what I was doing. I knew what I wanted to say, which helps. But I, I wanted these five metre square panels and they were lit with deep, deep blue but the, the extremes right and left are a lighter blue. And the notion was that when they came together and they were very hung very closely together, there was a kind of vibration. And I'm pleased to say, I think it worked. <laughs> you could almost hear that blue humming. And to come to the content, the middle panel is blank, is void. The two panels either side are a piece of string, elasticated thread, and the two extreme ones are that thread vibrated. So it reads from the outside in to a void or from void out to manifestation. There's this little crack of light and then all hell lets loose or the opposite mm -hmm. like. Um, so that was it and it's called Source. And it was, um, it was a one-off. It was, again, some people scratched their heads, me re seemingly reinventing myself again. But if nothing else today, I hope there's, you can see a thread coming through this work, no pun intended. I like the way photography affords us the opportunity to move away from a distinctive style, brushstroke, whatever. Yeah. So it's like you know, Tom Norman once said, you know, what's your new album? And that's yeah. a musical thing as well. What's the new album? Mm -hmm. And I like that as a, as a, a you know, way of describing what I try to do. And they can be quite discreet and different in some ways, but in other ways not. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, and uh, absolutely. And a lot of photographers, a lot of artists um, of, of whatever genre, really, tend to be doing the same thing throughout their career. I mean, you know, it, it, and, it, you know, galleries like that, of course, because, you know, some people buy work before it's done. Um, yes. Yeah. And you're often accused, you, you, you need a voice as an artist. Well, yes and no. Some of the music I like, my favourite Talking Heads album is Fear of Music. There's mm -hmm. 10 different styles of music. <laughs> I think when they found their groove, for me, they became less interesting. But that's just, I was brazed with the Beatles, of course. Okay, right, Dave, thank you. So moving on then, still on as an occurrence. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, you're, you're brilliant with titles, Dave. You know, it, it, it's, you must spend a lot of time thinking about the title for each of these projects uh, in a way that, you know, gives us an end to what it all means without giving too much away, without explaining it, you know. So this stillness and occurrence from five years in the making by Joe, <laughs> 1995 to 2000. Bonkers. And there were, what, were there about 20 images in the series, Dave? There's 15. Can I say a bit about titles? Yes, yes. Yeah, you're right. And that comes from, you know, my time as a songwriter or at least you know attempting to be a songwriter and um i love economy of language you know and um stillness in the currents i borrowed this actually from a, a, a buddhist text by someone called pema children um but it struck me as just perfect for this it had a very written title to begin with but again it's the opposites and the, the, the presumption here is that stillness and the occurrence are the same thing. I'm kind of deeply into that non-duality thing at this stage. But without even knowing about that, I hope people can enjoy. My get out of jail card is usually that the images tend to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. Not that many people like the beauty. Some people see it as a kind of veil to whatever, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a sucker for it still. So that, yeah, so the titles are important. In five years, this was shot on medium, on film, medium format film in the, using the North Sea, you know, that's why it took five years. It was completely obsessive. Because I had to, you, you needed these certain weather conditions, oh, didn't you, Dave? You know, I was on the point of the Coast Guard every night. I mean, they are astonishingly beautiful. I'm lucky enough to have a print of this image yeah. uh, on my sitting room wall. 
Um, a really, really lovely, uh, lovely set of images and consistent, you know, if you, if you go through them, you know, the, they are so beautifully consistent. Yeah, just, thank you. And, 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 yeah, I, sorry. I think I can. Sorry. Yeah. And John McKay, I'm nice that okay. Gloria showed these, just a message for Gloria, who's in touch with me yesterday, actually. Yeah, right. Um, oh, right, yes. Richard Engel okay. and uh, Zelda in London. So yeah. they've had a wee bit of an outing, but never been shown in their totality in Scotland. And I would like to do that sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they've been shown here. Okay. So are we okay to move on, Dave? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So this is the beginning of um, uh, your sort of major embracing project, One Taste Never Changing. Um, and there are three projects here um, from, from Japan. And it seems to me that when you went to Japan, you really hit a very rich seam, a, a rich seam of, of, of practice uh, when you were there. Um, <laughs> And I think was this the, was this the first series that you did cedar tree? Yes. And, mm. In two thousand three. So, <laughs> do you want to say something about one taste? Yeah. Never changing. Yes. Um, again, one taste is common, and you know, I'm not a Buddhist. I was interested in such things for a while, and again, Buddhist is a non-dual philosophy, so I'm drawn to particular kind of Zen side of that and the way that the language is used. Um, so one taste is what it is, one taste. It's a notion, and this is what will come into typology, which I'm sure you're going to raise, is something that changes but never changes. So that's where the end comes in. It's ever changing but never changing. So it's, you know, a mantra would come under that category. Yeah. Okay. Um, which seems to change, but in fact it's not. <laughs> um, and th through that, we'll maybe talk about that as you go through the images, actually. Yeah. OK, let's, ha let's have a look at this series then. Sure. So these are triptychs taken uh, to very describe as quickly as I can. The middle panel is the shot. The right hand panel is taken from the left hand side of the shot. The left hand panel is taken from the right hand side of the shot. So you basically you've got future, present, past. <laughs> indefinitely as it were just kind of just like a rubik's cube of the moment or the moment containing future present past mm. and of course they're pretty as well but it's a cedar tree shot from a fixed position this is very well expressed by tom norman actually the linear progression the sense of time unfolding is made to turn back on itself so that present past and future become one never changing thing Beautifully yeah. seen, actually. Yeah, it's great. Quite a lot to take on here, but so the again they're beautiful, I suppose. Hopefully, um, but there's a bit more going on in there than just that. Some people just see the beauty and think, "So what?" But um, so we're going from morning through till night. So that's me standing in the middle of the road. There's traffic, <laughs> there's traffic driving around me. I'm drinking gallons of water in boiling heat, and um, we're coming to sunset. So was this all shot on one day then, Dave? Yes, oh yeah, from sunrise to sunset. Yeah. So there's eight. These so so we've gone, we've gone, we've gone from a project which took you virtually five years to produce, you know, your stillness and occurrence, yeah. to this project, which you've shot in one day. Of course, a lot longer in terms of editing and in terms oh, of yeah, creating the panels yeah. and, and all of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And th these have been shown at Summer Hall, actually. There's, there's small versions of them. With Engel, maybe, maybe, maybe I could just mm -hmm. I could just flip back, sure. just so you get an idea of it. It's almost like a um, an animation. Beautiful. Thank Lovely. you. Thanks. This is just a nice way to kind of end it, and also for what's coming. Photographs, especially groups of similar photographs, tend to demonstrate that time and space are not laws of physics, but human metaphors invented to keep everything from happening all at once in the same place. I mean, it's very <laughs> funny, but it's from a very serious essay on typologies by Rod Slemons. Yeah. Zeroing in, what a great title. Right. Yeah, sorry. The notion of zero is important in typologies, actually. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we won't, won't go into that here, but the notion of the zero. <laughs> um, okay. You're, you're re removing duality in a way. And um, we'll maybe talk about that a wee bit as we yeah. proceed. But those pictures, yeah, they're being shown in, in Summerhall, the small versions. Mm. And we're, this is us coming to, Robin, another project under the same umbrella, I think. Yeah. Yeah, but a bland aesthetic, you know. Um, I mean, I think what I'd want to say about your typologies, you know, ones we've looked at and the ones we're, we're going to look at, is that although, you know, the, the ghost of the Beckers and Veneca Dijkstra are still with us, you know, uh, the, the, the banality of their image making, the almost non aesthetic or anesthetic, <laughs> you could say, uh, yeah. means of picture making. But, but yours certainly aren't bland, Dave. I mean, you might call them typologies, but you, yeah. you know, it, the aesthetic is still, and notions of beauty are still very, very important. Yeah, and I kind of pirated this quote, actually. I think Brian Dill is a great, great um, writer on photography. He means more, really, I think, the kind of William Eggleston thing, which I love. Yeah. The quotidian kind of, you know, you know, fag in a, in a, in a, in an ashtray, you know, mm -hmm. and that's your lot. That's all you get. A salt cellar on a table. Yeah. He kind of, but I, as I say, kind of pirated this a bit because in a way there is a blandness in typology because you know what's coming in a way. Um, but the business of undoing the subject and object is what interests me mm. because typology tries to do that. I mean, yeah. Very theoretical, and you might people might not like it, or it might seem a bit dry, but in a way, in that old postmodern manner, you're trying to remove the author. You're saying this is authorless. Once I've set up that frame, which we'll look at in a minute, mm. the camera, if I could wind it up, and the tripod and say, "Look, you climb that hill five times every day for three years, whatever I did, you know, and take these pictures," it would do it. It doesn't need you. Yeah. What happens? Within, within that strict frame, things happen that you have to include. Mm. There's the spontaneity. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. You know what I mean? So these are 88 prayer bells from a, a series of temples in Kyoto, mini temples, beautiful little things actually. And again, it's this one taste, it changes, but it doesn't. So it's okay. a technology of sorts, sorry, yeah. So you could go through them quite quickly actually. Okay, so here we are. That's the bells. That's the, that's they're, they're they're under a canopy outside the little huts, which are temples. Beautiful. Well, <laughs> they look beautiful here. So the lighting's the same. The distance from the bells is the same. The bells' distance from the background they're on a table um, is the same. And the background, you take what you get. There's amazing. Look at those shapes. Oh my God! How lucky is that? There's the number 25 there, slightly out of focus, dreamlike, remnants of prayers on the top right hand that have been pinned there. And it's a mantra, it's a kind of visual mantra, it's a visual equivalent, again, to talk musically of maybe Philip Glass or Steve Reich or... At least I think so, I mean, maybe some people might not agree. I've never seen these exhibited. It, it would look, I mean, they're, they're quite small prints, aren't they? Small, yeah. <clears throat> you know, going back to your, your is ecstasies again. Mm. You know, they're quite small, they're contemplative. <clears throat> For this PowerPoint, I did consider trying to fit, you know, about uh -huh. 30 into one frame. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, but I thought, no, yeah. no I'll just... Uh. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh -huh. And of course, they're absolutely in sequence. You've know, you got to get them all, as they say in Pokemon, and they have to be in sequence. I felt quite mad doing these, I have to say. I mean, I really felt I was at the end. <laughs> and the locals, of course, thought I was bonkers. Mm. Number 68. But they ended up bringing me food and coffee and I became a kind of pilgrim. When this is a pilgrimage around these 88 temples, they have 88 equivalents on an island called Shikoku that are the size of cathedrals. Mm. And it was my dream, still is, to go there before I shuffle off. Take you six months to get around them. Yeah. But I think, I don't know, I do like this work, I have to say. So no, I, do, I do too, and it's, I mean, the, the, the place for this to be seen is definitely on a gallery wall, isn't it? No doubt, and I, I have a little fantasy actually, which I'll reveal when we come maybe to the next ones, because I think I'd like to show them with, 
uh, although they relate to the even the previous project in the, the Buddhist temples, mm. the next one I think they they relate very closely to. So this is still one taste, never changing. So we're still in this type type of uh, logical territory, and we're still in Japan. We're still in Japan. This is two thousand and nine, though. This is a, this is an establishing shot of um, there's a tradition in Kyoto, been there for a long, long time of couples sitting by the river, normally heterosexual couples, um, and they sit by the river at a respectful distance and have their lunch and chat, and it's a very, very sweet thing. It took me ages to work out how to do this, but so these are, now just before we go into them, there's a few here, Robin, as you know, there are mm. 72 of these. <laughs> I want to do 88. And to have the bells in one room in these, in these yes, rooms. yes, because it's the same deal. You know, they look very different, but they're not, and very, very typological. But um, in some respects, shooting these was looking. I showed these in a talk once, and somebody said that reminds me of Cartier Bresson's "By the River." You know, the guy pouring the bottle of wine, looking down on the river. Is it Seine or something? For the family. Yeah. Uh, yes. On, on it's. Uh, on the banks of the Seine, yeah. Yes. This is the opposite. I'm waiting for the undecisive moment. Well, this, this is, I would say that, here's the exception. I'm kind of waiting for the moment when nothing's happening. But, and yet, you know, coming back to this thing about the aesthetic, I mean, you, you almost can't help yourself, Dave. You know, you've got to make a picture here. I can't you know? help myself. And, 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 and you've got to, you, you've got to look at the colours and, you know, as you say, this is an exception of that duck or a goose or whatever it is taking <laughs> off in the water. I mean that's quintessential David Williams, isn't it? You know, that that little detail of something happening in the background. It's, it's from, as I say Robin, I've produced more crap than any other photographer on the planet, I think, but it is from years of contemplation. Years. You yeah. know, you know I, I'll go there, I was working on the bells, and I see these reflections in the water, I'm thinking, bloody hell, mm. at a particular time of day. Then I see the couples, I'm thinking, wow, the reflections aren't always there, of course, but um, so all ages, all shapes and sizes, all backgrounds, but they're so well turned out. <laughs> it sounds patronising, but the Japanese, they're just so sweetly decked out, you know. And, you know, this, this image, for example, I don't know whether you can remember, mm. um, but, you know, the two people both wearing white. But the wonderful thing about this picture is the guy with the hat Yes. And he's got his head tilted towards the woman. Yeah. Now, now, tell me you didn't see that, Dave. Well, of course, in the yellow. I mean, the, the, <laughs> the smattering of yellows. Yes, absolutely. You know, definitely. And I had a particular, we don't have time to talk about it here. I don't know, Robin, with photography, we talk about this occasionally, you know. I have to say, some of the street photography I see these days, I find quite offensive actually and I'm aware with here here I'm taking pictures of people that don't know they're being mm. photographed photography's moved on a lot in that respect but I still feel kind of justified in doing it I don't think I'm abusing them they're largely mm. unidentifiable actually but photography is a controversial medium still even this is kind of controversial where are the gay people yeah well in fact they're not there I, in my experience anyway it might have changed since but um it tended to be I love this one with the scarf keeping yeah, it together. Of course, of yeah. course, it's just gorgeous, isn't it? Yeah. And there's beautiful details. For once, I was using a big, well, it's early days, a big SLR as a, a Nikon, I think, I've got just for this project. But the prints are, the details just, oh. Anyway, that's so Was this one of the first digital projects you did then, Dave? Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. But, but this, is, this is gorgeous, you know. I mean, this isn't, to call this a typology, well, of course it is, and you've explained all that, but, you know, this goes this could stand very easily by itself couldn't it you don't yeah, you know. yes yes but just you know one ha mcdougall around recording in progress is saying <laughs> <Good. laughs> thank you <laughs> okay, okay dave um so yeah this is what I do day to day still. I mean, I've moved location to do this. I was in my attic before, but the signal wasn't strong enough. But up there, there's thousands of these things, thousands, I think, pinned to the wall. And it's like a Rubik's Cube. And I can it's the same as a zooming difference. It was through this little, well, huge project. It's never been seen really. This spawned a collaboration with um, Ali Smith, the novelist, and well, more than novelist. She was very drawn to these. So we worked together for a year actually on her adding text to these, 
it never saw the light of day. Maybe someday it would be exhibited. I don't know. It didn't quite. It was lovely to work with her. She's a force of nature, as you can imagine. But she was, she's very taken. A lot of writers are. This business of pulling together disparate things appeals. <laughs> So, so, so this coupling here, for example, yes. this diptych, I mean, just say something about your thinking and okay. bringing these two images together. Absolutely. Well, this is a, I, mean, I photograph anything, <laughs> and then sometimes later on it makes sense of it. But, so this is an aerial view. I go to uh, Spain, Menorca quite a lot, and you will see some more kind of focused versions of this in a minute. Photographing this, rather nice, colours are nice, peoples are nice. And then the sky. And the notion is that the clouds move and shift like these people. The difference, <laughs> we're dreaming difference, it's the same thing. Yes. Yeah. More than okay. More. So there's resonances, mm. etc. You know. That's says that goes without saying. <laughs> um, that's Samuel when he was eight years old. I can't remember actually. And that's him when he left for university in the same bath. Of course, in the old days, he would allow me to be in a bath with him at great times. No way. No. <laughs> <laughs> but that's in the same bath. And, uh, but, but you, you know, I mean, you could say this is, uh, this, is <clears throat> this is lucky. I mean, that beautiful image of Samuel on the left hand side with just that drip of water on his chin. I don't know whether anybody can see that. Just a drip of water on his chin. And on the right hand side, you know, this young adult with a drip of water in his ear, you know, I mean, it's perfect. Yeah, right. perfect. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an obsessive one, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. This is Samuel again. Oh, man. I find this quite hard to look at in some ways. It's funny, but it's not. It's, for me, he's, I don't know, he's killing his childhood. That's how I read on that, mm. my take. It. And that's, that's a dummy that I found in and these wee ribs bursting through <laughs> his body, you know. Mm. Oh dear. So this is ongoing, Dave, isn't it? It's I mean, ongoing this is forever. Something, this is me something that you started uh, in uh, 2012. 14. Uh, and you just add to it. And you add to yeah, it. And it's so what is this? This is an outlet for a show. I, I, Ali wrote yeah. some very beautiful things. With this. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, and then yep. the work you've been doing in Portobello Promenade since 2015, and which one didn't culminate, but you had a, an installation, a video installation, didn't you? Yes, we did. And it was mid, mid lockdowns, and it was, it was a lovely evening. It was a good turnout, actually. And this, what you're seeing is a projection onto this massive building by the, the shore. The, the sea that you're seeing there is moving image, it's film. The images come out of the sea and dissolve back in, sometimes in pairs. It's the diptych thing again, the opposites thing, the resonance thing again. They go back into the sea. And I've made a book of this and I was hoping to publish, but um, again, it's need to raise a lot of money, but with Andy McGregor, I should say Andy McGregor was signal in putting this together. So there's a little bit of text there from um, uh, Alan Spence, the poet, Edinburgh's poet laureate. But it was a great night. It was a really good night and um, I was quite tearful when I saw it. Mm. it I just didn't know if it was going to work. I think it did work, actually. And it rolls through. It's like a narratives of uh, broken little narratives. You can't really see this, but um, these images are talking to each other, really, and then disappearing back into the sea and coming out you know, in various combinations. And so, yeah. <laughs> Great yeah. insulation pictures as well, Dave, if I may say so. Well, no, I, well, I, Andy took these. Uh, <laughs> I'm very indebted to Andy McGregor, he's such a, mm. a wonderful. I get help from great people like yourself and down the years, everybody, you know. I, I, I don't know, I'm pretty hopeless in some ways. People have had it, and it's helped me as well. Um, all sorts. Okay. And, Sorry, Dave, I didn't want to cut you off there. Did no, you? no, that's no. fine. Um, so, I, as you've said, over the years, you've dipped your toe in moving image, in video. Uh, I remember you did a video of sunflowers, which you oh, yeah. took way back in Italy in the early 90s. Well, um, can I just say something about that? Yes, yes. Because again, the title, that was a long piece, actually. And again, it was Julie Lawson who got behind that portrait gallery. It was called Findings Bitter Sweet. Yes. And that notion of the bitter and the sweet together 
you know, we're getting near yeah. the end now, but for me, it's very important actually. Yeah. It's bittersweet. What I'm trying to do is evoke that, you know, obviously a sense of well being, but something, a sense of loss and longing that is always there. And I think that's why a lot of us make work. I mean, to plug that gap mm. of incompletion, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it, you know, as I said at the beginning, we're looking at a small selection, you know, of your work and really to do each of these projects justice. It's almost like a lecture, you know, on its own that is required. Um, and but maybe we just before we show this this mm. little video, I mean, it, I, I start. I said that your work is is wide ranging. Uh, I wouldn't say it's disparate; it's wide ranging. But I think you would say, Dave, would you not, that it's all coming from the same place? I would. Oh well, you know, in terms of what I just said, yes, that business of plugging the gap. I mean. Yeah. I don't know if you go along with it, the business of, that's the only way I can describe it actually. Maybe the only, this is a really, really sad thing to say. Maybe not as I get older. So maybe the only time I feel okay is when mm. I'm making work. Yeah. And that, look, Robin, we're old enough to be able to say these things now without being embarrassed. You know? yeah. um, and it's um, Hamilton Finlay, who, of course, you, you managed to get the most amazing things out of him, the comments and the work that you did with him. He talked about a return on the artist's part to, I think he called it, a, I don't want to misquote him, a pre-verbal state mm. and really a return to God, actually, which he acknowledged. Now, he wasn't a man for God at all, really. Yeah. I would have thought, you know more than me, but a, re a return to some kind of completion. And of course, being Finlay, the way he, he ended up by saying, you know, the remarkable thing is that the work can often make it, but the artist rarely does. Yes. And he yes. talks about wanting that same hit yes. again and again okay. and again. When it becomes more, and I think my talk, this leads nicely onto my discussion with um, Alicia. Her work's very, very different from mine. Now, Alicia's overtly socially engaged. She's an activist, in fact. Her motivation for making the work, superficially at least, might be very, very different. My sense is that at the end of the day, it's probably not, you know. And that we make work for almost the same, the same reason, all of us. And hopefully other you, you can take people on your journey. Not everybody like, likes what I do at all, of course. Yeah. But, okay. Uh, anyway. Thanks, Dave. Well, look, let's just, in quiet contemplation, let's have a look at this video. Um, hoping the sound works okay. Yeah, thanks, Robin. It lasts for, I think, three minutes. And because we're not seeing it, it's just finished. There's probably some finishing touches to take on.
Lovely. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. It's, 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 it's 25 minutes and we're still oh. the week. It's the last for 25 minutes. And I think, if I can say this, <laughs> Robin, I think, you know, it ends us, we end up back in the pram really after all this. It's where we started out and you and I both know which end of the pram we're in. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Dave, thank you so much for that. It's just been a joy to oh. look at some of these old projects. Um, they may be old in years, you know, for, for anything between 40 and 10 years ago, um, yeah. but they last well, I think, Dave. Oh. I, think they, I, th I think they survive well. Maybe we could see if anybody has any questions. I'm not sure whether to put the questions in the chat box or whether you can raise a hand, but um, I think there is a chat box. Um, now, should I come out of screen sharing? Should I do that? Um, John, should I come out of screen sharing or not? Um, well, well, Robert, I, if, if you don't mind, I, I'll just pick up on some of the questions, if you if you like, would that be helpful? Yeah, th that would be great, John. Yes, if you don't mind, thank you. Yeah, so so there's, there's a question for both of you from uh, Pradip Maldi. Um, both of you are highly valued educators mm -hmm. and have taught extensively together. I've, I've often asked others about what words they have for novices and students, but in, in your case, what advice would you give to young educators of art and photography? So, um, Dave, maybe you'd like to go first? Yeah. These days, photography sits in quite a, quite a complex place, actually. I think post-digital photography has gone through a trauma, but it's also positioned it in some ways in a more interesting space because the emphasis might be more now on the ideas. You, we all used to hide behind our perfect prints and things before, <laughs> and although Pradip can rightly hide behind his perfect prints, but um, prints that he does. The word fearless would come to me. Remember, I have no training in photography and um, it's instilling a sense of fearlessness. And, you know, I'd, it, it sounds a bit trite, but not being afraid to break the rules, et cetera, et cetera. That's where the institution that you go to to be taught, and this is where I know of Prad, who's, who's a master educator, believe me, I've worked with him. He can elicit that from students. And that would be my, that would be the word for me, it'd be fearlessness. Yeah, and I, Dave, I totally agree with that. And Prad, that's a, that's a belter of a question you just asked. Uh, um, I mean, I think one thing I used to say to students constantly, you know, um, you know, I, I could show them my work, I could show them Dave's work for that matter. Um, and, but there's no way I want people to take pictures like me. I think, you know, I want, always wanted people to think about the pictures they're taking, to be able to answer the question, what's this about? Okay, it's a picture of a, an old guy in a pram, but what is it about? What are you trying to say? What does it mean, you know? And I used to say to students, come on, I want to be astonished. You know, I want to see something uh, that is of you um, and something that maybe, maybe I haven't seen before or something that is totally distant from the sort of work that I would produce. So I think the answer for me, yes, fearlessness, but also on behalf of a, a teacher, you know, humility. I think humility is 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 a really yeah. important thing to have. But hey, Prad, you know, if you come back to me in half an hour's time, I might have a different answer. Yeah. <laughs> and just just to add, if I could, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. I mean, the fearless thing. It's easier said than done. But the thing is, you're in the right, in a safe environment. You can do that. Um, I'm amazed at how fearless I was. I haven't always, I'm, I'm a very fearful person. But when I did those is ecstasies photographs, I was very fearless for some reason. Despite all the odds, actually, they were all stacked against me. I wasn't getting much positive feedback. That's quite rare, in me anyway. But within, and I was, you know, I wasn't in a, a teaching environment. 
but hopefully you can have you can institutionalize photography without making it too restricting is all i'm saying that's me good any more questions john john any more questions yeah sorry robin uh yeah there's, there's a question from alicia bruce uh she says i like to chat that we had recently dave about fear before making portraits how do you both feel about channeling the fear <laughs> of the work robin well i um i remember an interview with snowden um whatever you think about aristocratic photographers uh, and he was interviewed once many, many years ago and said, you know, you've been taking portraits for decades now. You must find it all quite easy. You know, you, you, and he said, absolutely not. He said, I'm, I'm totally uh, consumed by anxiety and fear um, every time I do a portrait. And I'm exactly the same. And in, in fact, as far as I'm concerned, I, I get worse as I get older. <laughs> you know, th there was an element of fearlessness about me, particularly when I was working commercially, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and I was fairly fearless then. The older I get, the more anxious I become. Um, and I find that very, very difficult to cope with. My antidote to that is that uh, when I do a portrait now, uh, whether it's in the studio or on location, I take my partner Marjorie with me. <laughs> and she's just great at chatting to people. She's a, a social emollient. So, yeah. so that's my strategy. But but no, fear, fear, it's a terrible thing, Alicia. And um, 